Joining us on the Informer today is Liberal MP, or should I say Maverick MP, Craig Kelly. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, great to be with you. But just one thing we should uh, clarify for my American friends. Uh, when we say liberal uh, down here, it's, it's the same way as the, uh, the water goes down the drain the other way. Um, it's the opposite of what it means. So we're liberal uh, in Australia actually means we're more the Conservative Party, uh, probably closer aligned to the, uh, the Republicans in the US. Now, there has been a lot of controversy around you and around a particular drug that everyone is talking about in regards to COVID, and that's hydroxychloroquine. So why do you think there is so much controversy around hydroxychloroquine? Well, firstly, the way I got involved in this is that uh, a couple of months ago it was now, I was just flicking through things on social media, and I saw a, a Facebook or a YouTube uh, post that a gentleman called a Dr. Zelenko had put together out of New York. And this was at a time when it was the start of the, the outbreak of the pandemic and there was a lot of fear about what was happening, a lot of bad news. And this Dr. Zelenko put together this video basically saying, hey, look, uh, uh, President Trump, I think I found something that can be really helpful. I think the combination of a hydroxychloroquine used with zinc can really make a big difference. I've, I've saved, you know, I think it was a couple of hundred patients and I've had no one that's been sick. So I thought this was like great news that should be shared on my, uh, on, on my Facebook page. So I, I just posted on my Facebook page and um, I get a very large following on my Facebook page, one of the largest political followings uh, here in the country. Anyhow, the next day I got a call from uh, what is our national uh, government uh, run uh, broadcaster called uh, the ABC, which is Australian Broadcast Corporation, which are uh, very uh, left leaning. And they said to me, you know, uh, would I apologize for posting this because Facebook, or sorry, YouTube had taken it down. I said, hang on a minute. I says, I'm not gonna apologize. This is actually a qualified medical practitioner. I've checked this guy's background before I posted it to make sure it was a, a legitimate medical practitioner. This is a legitimate medical practitioner. How is he being censored by someone from YouTube that might have an arts degree? I said, this is, this is illogical. I said, you are missing the story here. The story is not that I posted it. The story is the censorship of a medical doctor's opinion. But that was sort of went over their head. So I don't know, maybe there's a, a, a bit of our con convict spirit in, in, in me that um, when, I, when someone tells you you can't do something or someone wants to censor something, you think, well, what's going on here? And I want to get more and more involved in it. So oh. once I... Sorry, continue. Yeah. So, so once I'd been, once that censorship was there, I knew, knew there was something on. So I went and read uh, everything I, I could on the subject on, on both sides. And to me, um, at first, I didn't know of a Professor Harvey Risk at, at first. And to me, it made, what I read was made sense. Well, hang on, this, this should be a, a treatment that's available. And what astonished me that here in Australia, that we have states similar to you as you do in the, the US, that we have a chief medical officer in each state and they'd actually banned doctors from prescribing the drug. So they'd actually interfered in that sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship and said, doctors, you cannot prescribe this. And, and in one state, the state of Queensland, they actually put a jail term in there. So, so someone like a Dr. Zelenko that had prescribed hydroxychloroquine and saved the lives undoubtedly of you know, countless of his patients, if he did that in Queensland here in Australia, he'd be facing a jail sentence. And, and I thought, this is madness. This is complete absurdity. So I made a few speeches in the, in the parliament about it. And uh, you know, sort of all the, uh, you know, the, the know-it-alls uh, on the other side of politics uh, uh, attacked me for it. But look, everything I read says that we are doing completely the wrong thing. And ultimately, it's not whether I'm right or wrong. All I'm saying is the freedom should be handed back to the doctors. It should be left in the doctor and patient's decision. It should, you should have trust in your family medical practitioner to sit down with you and go, look, you know, these are the pros, these are the cons, these are the treatments available, and you sit down and decide. That is what a free democratic society is all about. It's a hardcore totalitarian regime that says, no, we are going to, we medical bureaucrats know what's better, and we are going to override you doctors and tell you doctors what you can and what you can and cannot prescribe when you have a lawful drug that's been uh, you know, lawfully approved for, I think, something like 
50, 60, almost 70 years. And this is, as I understand, the first time ever that medical bureaucrats have interfered and taken a, a lawful drug and said, no, you can't prescribe it for something off label. So why do you think Australian politicians are doing that? Well, it's, our, of course it's, it's Australian, it's our medical bureaucrats mm -hmm. that are doing that. It's our chief medical, uh, you know, we've got a, a, what we call here a TGA, which is, I th think, similar to your FDA uh, over in the States. Uh, they've made a certain recommendation uh, that the drug shouldn't be used for, for COVID. We've also set up another body called the National COVID Evidence Task Force, and they put recommendations uh, that the drug shouldn't be used. And then there's, and the state medical office to rely on those. But when you go and you ask them, okay, what have you based your decision upon? It's the most frivolous and scant evidence. The only thing they can hold up is what they call the recovery trial out of the UK, mm -hmm. which they say, so this was the only randomized trial. But when you look at that trial, it is completely irrelevant uh, and should almost be disregarded as far as hydroxychloroquine's efficacy is. Um, for COVID. Because firstly, if you look at uh, professors like Professor Risch uh, and Dr. Zelenko, the way they recommend hydroxychloroquine is not just by itself. They say you use that as a combination, is with a combination uh, with zinc, and zinc is the main element, as where the hydroxychloroquine is just basically a zinc ionophore. And you combine that with other, uh, other sort of azithromycin or something that's uh, like, a, you know, a, not, uh, what's the correct word for it? Um, uh, like an agent to help protect protect you from infection that's, the, that it's there for. So an now antibiotic or? Yes, yeah, an antibiotic, yes, an antibiotic. So here we have this recovery trial that one, it doesn't use zinc, and two, it is given very late in the infection stage. Because all the, uh, the doctors that advocate for hydroxychloroquine say there's a window of sort of basically the first five days, maybe six days, where hydroxychloroquine with zinc can be effective. And after that, it's not effective, you've got to look at other treatments. So this recovery trial failed on zinc. It failed that it didn't give the, uh, the, the hydroxychloroquine and the zinc, um, it gave it too late. But most importantly, it was the doses. Now, I, when I first told about this, someone said to me that they've overdosed the patients. I thought, look, this can't be right. Surely this has to be a mistake. But lo and behold, when you go through the actual paper itself, they loaded the patients up with 2,400 milligrams in the first day. Now, under uh, what Dr. Zelenko recommends, which he calls the Zelenko principle, he recommends uh, 200 milligrams twice a day for five days. So that's 400 milligrams over five days, a total of 2,000 milligrams over the course, that's it. But in this study, they gave the patients 2,400 milligrams on the first day, and they gave them another 800 milligrams a day for the next nine days. So we're getting close to 10,000 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine that this study gave these people over a um, period of nine to 10 days. Now, other medical professionals have looked at this and have called this insane. Even for malaria, when you read the, the trial for malaria, if you are taking hydroxychloroquine as a malaria prophylaxis, it's 200 milligrams a day, once a week. So as a malaria, pro you would take 800, 400 milligrams over the two week period. Here they've given them almost 10,000 milligrams. That just seems insane that this would even happen in any trial that they would overdose them. One um, correlation that I found with the recovery trial when I was researching was that that came out of Oxford, I believe, the recovery trial, and Oxford yes. is currently developing a vaccine. Fancy that. Fancy but, that. What, what, what a strange coincidence. So that but was also, going to be my question. Is this something that is about money? Well, look, something is behind this because it defies logic and it defies common sense. Anyone with the basic common sense looks at this and say that if you're going to break that doctor-patient relationship, if you're going to interfere in that sanctity of the relationship, what standard should you apply? And, and I say it should be the, the criminal law standard. You've got to know beyond all reasonable doubt, 
shouldn't just be on the balance of probabilities. It should be on beyond all reasonable doubt that you are absolutely sure that by interfering in the doctor-patient relationship, you are not going to do more harm. And I don't see how you could anyone with any sense whatsoever could look at the evidence, look at it, uh, you know, without any bias, and say, well, there's got to at least be some doubt, and therefore I'm going to step back and I'm going to leave it to the doctors at the cold face to make that decision with their patients. So the bureaucrats are looking at this trial and saying, okay, this is dangerous because there were obviously major side effects in the recovery trial. And most supporters of this decision would say that they're doing it to protect the citizens of Australia. Is there any chance that they're doing the right thing and these, these other studies are just wrong? Well, let's say what well, you're talking about now, you look at the studies that show the effectiveness of uh, hydroxychloroquine when used in the first, uh, the early, so the early period, first five, five to seven days. There's 11 studies, and all 11 out of 11 show that it's effective. Now, the chances, if, if you were, if you were just a 50-50 chance, if you're getting a coin and tossing it in the air, and you were coming up with uh, 11 heads in a row, I think the probability is something like. Uh, it's less than half of 1%. So the probability that all these studies are, are, are wrong is just statistically approaching zero. And, and also when you look at this recovery trial as well, those that in this trial, remember, over a thousand people died. So they, imagine if you're running a medical trial and you enroll uh, 4,000 odd people, 4,700 people sign up to the trial, and a quarter of them die. A quarter of them never recover. The, the differences and the differences in um, those that, I think it was 24% that those that, 24.7 uh, or something percent of those that took uh, so-called uh, usual care died. And it was something like 27% of those that they loaded up with this toxic dose of hydroxychloroquine died. So statistically, there wasn't much difference anyway. And the idea that you've got to run some type of people, so you should run a, a proper full randomised trial to show that it works. Well, hang on a minute. What that actually means is that you've got to do a trial and you've got to have sick COVID patients at risk of death. And you may give them, instead of a drug, that there's a very high likely chance it will save their lives. As part of your experiment, you're going to deny this and give these people a placebo, which could put their lives at risk. This, this is like Dr. Mengel sort of stuff, Dr. Frankenstein type, type of stuff of what they're asking for. Have you spoken directly to the Prime Minister about this? Yes. Yes, I have. And, and also what is your response? Well, they, they fall back, uh, all our ministers fall back on the reliance of what they get from the senior bureaucrats. So... Uh, and I can understand that position. If, if I'm the, the health minister of the country, I've got all these health bureaus, and, and neither of them are, are medical doctors. So they've got to rely on the, um, the advice that they are getting from the basically the bureaucratic structure that's in place there. So that I, I can understand their position. So this is why I've always been criticising uh, the decision basis of what these health bureaucrats are doing. Now, often people say, well, you know, you're not a doctor, Craig. And no, I'm not, I don't pretend to be a doctor. But I know there are hundreds of doctors, if not thousands of doctors around the world that very clearly say that swear by this. There was a doctor in California, uh, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he said he's treated 1,700 COVID positive patients and had zero deaths, one hospitalization, and what has he done differently? He's used hydroxychloroquine and zinc in his treatment protocols. So final question before we finish up part one of this interview. Okay. Do you have any allies within your own party or on the other side? Well, I have, on my own party, yes. There's a few very good uh, colleagues in my own party that have actually come out and supported me on this. Uh, and we've got a lot of other colleagues that at the moment uh, are sort of treading carefully but looking at it closely. And hopefully in the next week, We'll have a few more of them that will be prepared to uh, put their, uh, you know, cross the line and uh, cross the Rubicon, as we say, and 
and advocate uh, for basically handing back the freedom to the doctors. Remember, we're not saying this drug works. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that. We are saying it should be left to the freedom of the doctors and the patients. And it is wrong for health bureaucrats in the government to interfere in that doctor's and patient's rights. Now, on the other side of politics, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, this is part of the campaign against this uh, is Trump derangement syndrome. Ever since President Trump spoke out in favour of it, there's been a large section of the media and politicians on the left uh, that have simply, this is a chance that I've, I can show that uh, President Trump is not only wrong, but he's dangerous. And therefore, they simply can't, uh, it's almost as though there's some mental defect that's a switch that's clicked in their brains that doesn't look, doesn't enable them to analyse the evidence in a rational manner. So unfortunately, the, the other side of politics at the moment has completely lost. They're all suffering from Trump derangement syndrome as far as I can see. We have talked about Trump derangement syndrome on the program before. Uh, thank you so much. We are going to be right back with part two.